The Brown Park Podcast is brought to you by Grow Clinics. They're leading the way in hair loss treatments in Australia and New Zealand. And for more information, go to growclinics.com.au. Hello. Hello. Uh, we have got some guests on the show today that I feel like you're going to love and I'm just going to take a back seat and let you guys talk about it. Look, I'm very excited about this one. These guys just, they're like the triple threats of the adventure world. They, they can do it all and they just love to push themselves out of their comfort zone, which is uh, excellent. They've got a new movie called Chase That Feeling and we're going to chase that feeling with them today. That kind of works. Oh, great lead in. <laughs> The Brown Box Podcast. Uh, what's in the cup today? What have you got? Uh, just uh, soda water today. Just soda water? Just soda water. Why do you ask? No, because I know that sometimes when we've got guests on the show, um, you like you, you have a cup of something. A cup of um, something, and, yes. And normally you hide it well in like a – well, last time when we were speaking to Nat Bass, you had a beer in a teacup. It was, it was a nice pink mug with just a little, little brewski in there. <laughs> you didn't want to look uncouth, so you put your beer in a teacup. It was lovely. Look, the last thing I wanted to do was look unprofessional. Yeah. <laughs> Brown pot. Special guest. Okay, today uh, our guests are uh, two gentlemen by the name of Blake Thornton and Matt Gilson, and they've got a new movie coming out called Chase That Feeling, where they've been filming themselves for the past seven years, getting out of their comfort zone, and we've got the boys uh, on the line. G'day, guys. How are you? G'day, guys. Thanks for having us. So how did it all come about? How, I mean, just take us back to how this whole thing came about. Oh, I actually love telling this story. So me and Matt, and, well, me and Gil, so we've been friends forever, right? And, um, you know, I've, I've surfed a lot and we used to kind of go on surf trips and we were actually in Mexico um, for a month and we're doing a lot of filming and the purpose was kind of to put out a surf edit, which was just going to be surf. Yeah, yeah. Um, but along the way, we were catching buses, staying in like, you know, people's backyards in their little huts and stuff. And we we're meeting a lot of people and kind of interacting with locals a lot. And, and Gilso kind of just started capturing more of that kind of content. Um, after the trip, you know, we put out the surf edit, which was cool, you know, but then Gilso made an edit called... Um, was the journey begins the journey begins yeah. yeah the journey begins and it was more it was literally probably like three waves of surfing it's a five minute video and the rest is just the lifestyle and the travel and the people and, yeah, nice. and that got that got insane traction and i think that was kind of the light bulb moment where we're like this is there's people enjoy this stuff yeah as much if not more than just the surfing the action um so that's kind of where i think the the, the kind of the real idea was spawned. Let's go through where you've been because it seems like you've been to all four corners of the world. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, look, in, in this, you know, it's not to say we're not going to do another one of these. So, in, yeah. you know, <laughs> <laughs> sequel in coming up. Uh, it's possible. It's a never ending concept. Um, so, yeah, Canada, Alaska, um, which we kind of bundled into one. They're, they're kind of neighbors in a sense. Um, we went to Tahiti which was purely surf. Uh, we went to Iceland, which is a very special place. We just dipped across the Tasman in New Zealand and we did a fair bit of stuff just in our backyard here, where, where I kind of am now, south coast of uh, New South Wales and Australia. Best moment of it. We, what's what's the absolute highlight? Because, I mean, look, looking at the, the trailer for the movie, um, A, you guys have got some mammoth balls because you were jumping off cliffs. <laughs> You were uh, flying, you were uh, surfing, you were in the, the ice. Um, you know, was there one special moment out of all of that where you guys just went, that was just insane? Um, for me, uh, Alaska was probably the highlight um, moment. Uh, it was a place, yeah, we, you know, there's expectations of, of, of Alaska being like these huge dramatic mountains. And obviously to, to go there, with, with you know, we had like, we pretty much had like a five day window, but you know, crews, film crews, snowboarders go there and sit there for a month, you know, and wait for the weather to clear where the snow's to be stable enough to snowboard. And, mm. um, yeah, like the whole build up, the, the flight out there, Blake been out of his element and just, um, yeah, just the sheer size and magnitude was just like this. It was one of the most special moments in my entire life. And then to obviously snowboard something that I've only, you know, dreamt about and watched in snowboard movies when I was growing up, like that's, you know, 
best, yeah, by far biggest highlight of um, of my life. Was there an avalanche or something that I saw in the clip? Cliff? Clip? Yeah, so that was actually in in, in Canada. Um, uh, a snowboarder that we were with hit this big backcountry jump and he he crashed on the landing and then just the impact just made the whole face um, crack and slide and then he kind of got dragged down and thankfully like the, his technique of trying to stay on top of it, he stayed on top of it, but, you know, it was like 50 square metres of, of, you know, at least a foot deep snow, so, you know, two, maybe even two foot deep. So, yeah, really dangerous moment where it just really shows you that, you know, Mother Nature's in control out there. You've got to be really be really careful with what you do and really, you know, make smart decisions. Was there any moment where you guys thought, this is it, we've gone too far and, oh, fuck, we're going to kill ourselves? <laughs> um, yeah, probably several times. Look, we're, we're, Perfect. We're, very, we're really calculated, though. Um, you know, we, we have a lot of faith in kind of our ability um, and our just, uh, I guess, our, our bodies, uh, physical fitness and stuff like that. So, But there was definitely times where, you know, we question, question things and, I don't know, we just kind of, we, we put, we, we trusted our ability to get us through those, those moments and uh, touch wood, they, we, we did, we did get through those moments. But yeah, there's definitely a ton of heart in your mouth moments um, just on the adventures and it's all, you can see it all in the film too. You guys are like triple threat, so you can skydive, surf, snowboard. What else can you do? Like, holy shit, I mean, if, if I could do one of those things well, I'd, I'd be... <laughs> I'd, I'd be pretty pumped. Full disclosure, so I I, I can't skydive on my own. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I get I get tossed out though. Um, you know, we, we're lucky. We got a friend who's a tandem master. But yeah, Gills Gills can do do all three. Um, but then as far as like what else? Uh, I don't like know. The, the fly suit that I saw you guys wearing. Yeah, that's Gills can talk about. Yeah, that. Sure. yeah. We were wearing wingsuits. We did a um a, a helicopter jump in Alaska. Uh, sorry, not in Alaska, in Iceland. And, um, yeah, we wore wingsuits and it was this old vo- volcano kind of glacier area. And, yeah, that was one of those moments where it was, you know, good in theory in the planning in the lead up to it. But then, like, you know, as it sort of all started coming together and the weather cleared and the chopper was arriving and we zipping our wingsuits, I was like, what the hell are we doing? <laughs> yeah. And then, um, yeah, it's just... It's human flight, you know. It's 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 the ultimate feeling of human flight. Like you would imagine, like Superman feels flying across the sky. That's like that's exactly what you feel. The suit inflates, and it just you you're going across the sky, at, you know, two hundred k's an hour. And those big suits have a glide ratio of, of three to one, so three meters forward to one meter down. So you you know you're covering a lot of ground. So yeah, it's um it's a yeah really special special feeling. And had you done it before then, in a yeah, wingsuit? Yeah, 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 that was probably my. 340th skydive or something. So, you know, oh, wow. you, you, usually you do, um, yeah, you have to do at least 100 skydives before you can wear a tracking suit, which is just like an inflatable kind of um, suit. That, that's the step, you know, step in the right direction towards wingsuiting. Wingsuiting, you have to have a minimum of 200 skydives. Mm-hmm. And then so pretty much from 200 to 300 skydives, I wore a smaller sort of um, beginner wingsuit. And then after 300, that's when I got the biggest suit, which has the, the um, you know, the, the glide ratio, uh, which is also, you know, more dangerous as far as trying to, you know, got to keep it in control. Mm-hmm. Like the, the big suit's like a Ferrari. So and there's this small suit's like a, a Holden Barina or something like that. Yeah. So, <laughs> Perfect. Um, so by my calculations, I've only got 200 skydives to go. Perfect. Yeah, I've got 300. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> So uh, yeah, no, well that's yeah, skydiving de- definitely a really special, um, you know, part of everything. And obviously, like like BT said, we've got a really good uh, childhood friend, Scotty Disco, is also in the movie. He's he kind of got me into it. He's the tandem master, uh, professional skydiver now. Um, and yeah, it's, it's really nice to have someone that you can trust, like you know, leaning on throughout. You know, it's it's, it's such a foreign thing to be given a backpack with material and strings in it and then open, the door opens in the plane and you're like, that's okay, go on, jump out. Yeah. It's, a, it's such a, it's such a um, uh, unique sport in, in the sense that usually most people go on airplanes and it's just like the doors are shut, it's nice and warm, you're getting your cup of tea, you're getting your um, you know, cheese and biscuits and then but just to see you know human beings basically get sucked out and diving out of a, a, a perfectly good, good airplane. It's just like it goes against everything that your mind's telling you yeah. um, what not to do. 
is, is the wingsuit then the next evolution of that? Like, because you, you would just jump straight out and hope for the best, wouldn't you? Do you have yeah, a parachute yeah. or anything with that? Or? No, yeah. Got, yeah, you've got to have a parachute. So with the skydiving rigs, you've got a main parachute and you've got a reserve. Yeah. Um, so you have to have, you know, it's, it's the way that they're designed, have, you have a, a spare one. Um, but, yeah, basically you just, you, just to get stable and get figuring out how to use your body in the air to sort of balance and stuff, you've got to obviously skydive without it, without a wingsuit. And it's still like so much fun. It's just such an amazing mm-hmm. feeling. You know, the rush of the wind and you're looking at the ground, the ground's rushing up at you. It's just, it's really, you know, if you've ever done a tandem, it's like that, but then you're in control when it's a solo, you've got your own parachute. Um, but again, that comes with its, you know, risk as far as once a parachute opens, that's, you're, you're halfway there, then you've got to actually land. Most of the injuries happen in skydiving with the parachute open. So they're, you're turning low to the ground or they don't yeah. get there in time or the wind, um, obstacles like trees and power lines and stuff. So half the battle the most enjoyable part for me is the free fall but then a lot of people scott i've just for the canopy work and just to fly the parachute down but yeah for me i just wanted to get use a parachute just to get me to the ground safely in the wingsuit how do you land uh so the wingsuit yeah so you still you pull a parachute but basically you kind of um collapse you collapse because you when you're going so f- um fast forward yeah. you've got a your your body movements have to be symmetrical so then when you pull your um your pilot chute for the parachute to start opening, you want to be going in a, you know, in a nice straight line because if you start leaning to one side, that's when malfunctions can happen with your parachute. So <laughs> you just got to you got to pull it going, you know, in a really straight direct line. So you collapse your sort of your side wings behind your body, and then you throw your, your pilot chute out. So it's just yeah, just timing and just you're really just trying to balance on on the air as you, as you're flying forward. So it's it's just technique. So did you think, Chris, I, I think Christo thinks that maybe you had to just flap your wings just well, as you come into no, land. I've like, got no <laughs> idea. That's why I'm asking so many questions about it. Yeah, I'm like, yeah. how the hell? I know. Well, yeah. The, it's not a bird, man. Now, the wingsuits now, is uh, they're like, you're able to gain altitude. Like, they, they, they've designed them so, they, you know, you can go down and, and you can you're using gravity, but they've got they've designed them so then you can kind of gain a little bit of, of altitude and, and kind of come to a, yeah. you know, a point where you're sort of moving up a lot of the base jumpers are wearing those things in europe and, and flying down cracks and valleys but that's like as far as you know that's a whole nother sport in itself yeah wingsuit base jumping and disco our mate does all that stuff so but he's like he's on that next level and he's the one who filmed me wingsuiting in, in iceland so he was the cameraman so he's a you know really good stable sort of flyer so you both didn't do the wingsuits uh, me, me and Disco did, yeah, BT, BT was just uh, hanging up with your life on the edge of the chopper. Yeah. I was like, nah. No, I was like, I mean, the whole thing was terrifying regardless, but um, yeah, I was kind of hanging out of the chopper, capturing, like, you know, filming yeah. the, whole, the whole thing go down. Um, and that was bad enough for me. <laughs> Round pop. So we've got to say thank you to our sponsor, Manscaped. Our new sponsor, Manscaped. Hello. Uh, Look, their products are precision engineered tools for your family jewels. I love it. You can join over 4 million men worldwide who trust Manscaped with this exclusive offer for our listeners. 20% off and free worldwide shipping with the code... Brown Park 20 if you go to manscaped.com. Now we've been sent the pack. Let's unbox it. So the first thing that they've sent through to us is the weed whacker. The weed whacker, the ear and nose hair trimmer. Oh, it pickles. You're not supposed to use the weed whacker on your balls, mate. Oh, <laughs> what? Really? Um, also in there, they've sent through a pair of um, the Manscaped anti-chafing boxer briefs. Then they have the piece de resistance. The actual lawnmower. The lawnmower 4.0. Electric groin and body hair trimmer. It's got a torch on it. I know. It's not that hard to see. I mean, doesn't yours need a, like a, a microscope or something like that? Or a... yeah. <laughs> and remember, if you go to manscaped.com right now, you can get 20% off and free worldwide shipping with the code BROWNPARK20 at manscaped.com. And thanks very much, guys, for coming on board the podcast. Thank you. Our podcast is proudly brought to you by Grow Clinics. They are leading the way in hair loss treatments in Australia and New Zealand. I had to go in the other day for my 12-month checkup, which has really now been 13, almost 14 months since I had the procedure done. Um, And they went through my old photos just to show me the difference between then and now on my head. And it is insane. 
you kind of forget about it too, don't you? Like when you're doing your hair now, it's just sort of part of the norm. But um, when you see the old photos of, this, of yourself, you're like, oh, wow. My enemy is actually the reminders from Google Photos. It's actually more <laughs> inspirational now, isn't it? I get these little notifications that go, bing, here's you from two years ago. And I'm like, oh, my God, that is insane. But if you feel like us and you look at photos of yourself and go, wow, I'm losing my hair, grow off the most refined hair transplant techniques available with natural results guaranteed. The best thing to do is to go and check out their website, which is growclinics.com. You can book a free consultation or if you're not even in the market for it yet and just want to explore your options, they've got a bunch of other options for you there as well. That's growclinics.com.au for more information. Brown Pop. You get a tease of everything that you guys have done out of the trailer. So I'm actually looking forward to it coming out on the streaming services so we can get a, a full picture of everything that you guys have done. Um, what did you go to Iceland for? Everything. <laughs> <laughs> so... Like uh, Gil's just said, uh, we went in the, the height of summer, so 24 hours of daylight, which is the weirdest Yeah, what's experience. that like? I couldn't it's, imagine that. It's so bizarre. Um, but, yeah, it was kind of just up to us and, and how far we could push ourselves. Um, look, and a hot tip, and I've told plenty of people this now, if, if you were to go to Iceland, go in summertime, and you could dead set not even adjust to their, their time zone and just you could do everything of an evening and there's no one around. And that's kind of... Kind of what we were doing, um, but yeah, the, the the glacier kind of um, lagoon, and then the the free diving stuff we did up there. Geez, the the water temps were coldest was two degrees um, yeah. at a place called Silfra, and they're lucky we had like I got a big custom wetty made by Mambo, like this big thick <laughs> five mil made out of Japan, like yeah, the nice. best, best rubber you can get, <laughs> and even yeah. still, like. You could feel every bit of it. Um, but then it's like when we're surfing, like the water's probably like six, seven degrees. It's not that that pure glacier fed. It's kind of the ocean. Um, yeah. And the wetsuits actually are so good nowadays that we, you, you actually, with the hood on, you find yourself getting hot. Mm. Like, because you, you're covering all your extremities, your fingertips, yeah. your toes, your head, and your head just heats up like crazy. So you're out there you know, kind of letting water in to, to yeah. kind of flush you down, which it, it's fresh, but it, yeah. definitely, like, it stops you from overheating. You just, you're just kind of on this, like, you know, balancing act the whole time you're in the surf because you're hot from paddling and surfing, but then, like, you let the water in, you're cold again. So, um, yeah, any anywhere from two to seven degrees, you can surf where those kind of um, icebergs were, those glacier, those chunks of glacier were. Um there is a little beach break in front there, but um, we uh, just going through them was enough. I wouldn't like to be dodging them. Um, <laughs> because it's, yeah, I think the age old saying you, you only see a small, small yeah. part of what there really is. Um, and you could hear them in the lagoon. You could hear just in the distance. The cracking. The cracking and they just like, they oh. just rotate unannounced and it's like, Mad. yeah, pretty, um, it's pretty surreal sounds, like very powerful. That's it's real nature. So I want to circle back just a minute. How did you two meet? So when we were like just into high school, our fathers actually went to the same high school together and have known each other. They knew each other for for since they were teenagers. Um, knew one another from just surfing down the beach. But then, uh, yeah, we just kind of met one morning. Our fathers got chatting and we got chatting. And I don't know we just – it's it's pretty – uh, this is like a, it's it's probably funny for girls too. It feels like we're just talking like we're in the movie, but like you literally meet so many people in life. Just yeah. constantly. Like you guys would know this too from from what you guys are doing, where you've been in your journeys. But you meet so many people, and like you just kind of know pretty quickly like the ones yeah. that you you know you're on the same wavelength with, and that just you know you got the same interests, and you you're just gonna get along. And that's that's basically we just feel like we knew that <laughs> straight away. And we're just almost, almost inseparable. I'll tell you a funny story, right? <clears throat> We'd actually known each other for 20, 20, years, yeah. 20 years. Our wives were best friends. Yeah. Um, and we used to show up to functions and go, yeah, there's a, there he is. Hey, how you going? And that was it. And, we sort of just, Later. and it wasn't until all the families about five years ago, six years ago, we all sort of got together and went on a holiday and we went, hey, you are right. We actually get along quite well. You're not too right. bad. <laughs> but had been circling each other as, you know, uh, for, for, for a good 20 years before we actually went, oh, no, we should do shit. This is fun. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. So it was a bit more than just the, the handshake. How you going? Yeah. Good. Good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Like it's, uh, and I think we kind of, you see a bit of this too throughout the film. We just like, we obviously have a lot of people join us on trips and stuff who are, you know, either athletes or, or filmers or personalities. Like when I say personalities, they're personalities to us. They're not actual like celebrity. Yeah. Um, yeah. But you know, all, all this stuff comes out in the film, but we, all the people that join us are very like-minded, quite easy going, like up for adventure, like down to earth, you know, we're, 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 it, it seems like we're really extreme individuals, but we're, we're still quite normal at the end of the day. We have, we have jobs, we have like, you know, partners, like he also has a child, like, you know, responsibilities, the same yeah. stuff everyone else does. So um, we, we really tried to tie that in, in the film and, and just, and, and, you know, motivate people and just inspire them that, you know, we, we're, we're no different. Like we're the same, you know, we, we, we kind of push ourselves a bit harder probably in like the sports and we dedicate a lot of our life to it, but we still got to go through the same shit everyone else does. We got to work a job. We got to like, you know, all, all those, those real world pressures. And I think it's true because life will pass you by unless you plan to do shit, right? Like if, if we don't plan something for a year, nothing will happen in that year, but if you set aside a plan, go right next year we're going to America, then you make that happen. But unless you make those plans or somebody drags you into those plans, you'll find yourself twenty years down the track with no stories, no adventures, or anything to show for it. So I love that you guys have actually made that that commitment a, to do this shit. Yeah, for sure. I'm a, I'm a I'm a big believer in. I just I just love putting stuff in the cal in the calendar. Yeah, like, yeah. And then it's just there, and you know, it's like. You know, you've got your work roster and all that stuff, but then you see something in like three, four, five months, and it's like you you know that's coming. It's it's like stimulating. Yeah, it keeps you like, motivated, doesn't it? Yeah. All of the, you know, you know, you're striving to something. That's a that's a thing I really love. Well, I got to about 43, 44 uh, and had one of those moments where like, I've done nothing. Like I've done no adventures. I mean, I've, I've had a great job. I've interviewed lots of people and blah, blah, blah. But I haven't actually had anything where I've tested and pushed my boundaries and gotten myself out of my comfort zone, which is one of the things you guys mentioned on your movie. Uh, and that's where Buffhead comes in over here. Yeah, that's me, Buffhead. Because, <laughs> because I've, I've said, oh, you know, I've never climbed a mountain. He's gone, all right, well, we're going to go and climb Mount Warning. Let's go. And I said, well, I wanted to, like, I had this wacky idea of wanting to go and visit Chernobyl, like the most volatile, wow. yeah. poisonous place on earth. And he goes, let's book a ticket. Let's go. <laughs> so, we, so we've been to Chernobyl. Wow, yeah, yeah. that's that's amazing. That is amazing. It was mad. So, it was such a mad trip to tour through this, you know, what was the most dangerous place on the planet at one point in time, yeah. and to be walking through there was it was amazing. A trip of a lifetime. Was, it was yeah. yeah. So like we actually spent three days out in Chernobyl. <laughs> so you actually you actually go to what's known as Hotel Chernobyl, and it's just like this dormitory, and you go out there for a couple of nights, and then they walk you through all the abandoned cities and stuff. Oh, and we wow. did we did that for for three nights, and that was just phenomenal. So we got a holiday and yeah. a vasectomy, perfect. Yeah. <laughs> and, a, and sterile and three heads. Yeah, it's great. Right, worry, worry about it in twenty years, eh? Yeah, um, that's but that's it. like you live in the moment, like, and that's that's another thing. Like, that's they're off the beaten track. Those kind of like the things you're doing. Like a lot of people will, you know, holiday and maybe do the same thing annually, and you know, yeah. like it's great. Yeah. Like that's fine. Like that's we're not saying there's anything wrong with that. Like either, but then if you do have that little thing inside you that wants more and wants to like experience more, that's, we tried to pick some sort of obscure places to, to go to like, and you know, for example, like we went to Tahiti surfing, but we didn't, we didn't stay in a hotel by any means. Like the place we stayed in was like, you know, tree huts that were at a friend's place. That was, you know, so it was, it was really like different. Like it's not, not new places by any means, but we, we tried to do, you know, obscure kind of experiences that really yeah. like showcase what is out there and what is achievable. And, and that's kind of, yeah, our, our whole motive throughout the film. So what's the most dangerous place you've surfed? Because I saw in the trailer there was a, a bit there where you said this this break has to be respected. Where was that? Um, just, Dion, just for some backstory, Dion's a mad surfer. Love surfing. Oh, nothing yeah. like nothing like you guys. Just not even yeah. going. We're not even that's going right. there. But um, Surf, yeah, surfing's where it's at, mate. Surfing's so much fun. It's just. The, an endless, an endless um, ocean of fun. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I love it. When you're talking about hitting um, icebergs or, you know, having the icebergs out there, I was thinking, geez, that re reminds me of hitting a few rocks at Kira on low tide a few times. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
I think uh, back to the, yeah, the, the point, I believe we're talking about like Chopu in Tahiti. Right. Um, it is, like we, it wasn't massive while we were there, but we got it pretty big. Um, and it is, it's pound for pound, like mm. right there with one of the heaviest waves in the world. Um, just like insane amount of volume of water in these waves and just it moves so fast and you're, you're staring at the reef as you paddle into these things. Our Tahiti sections is is from a surf point the the surf content is nuts um really powerful a lot a lot of good action there so um but there's another wipe out too in the in the trailer from the um the cape fear event which was on in 2016 i surfed in and that was yeah like the silliest waves i think they've ever run a surf contest in and yeah i was lucky to survive that which was good for someone that's a non-surfer what do you mean by silly waves? Because I, I I am not a surfer. I'm scared of three them foot in the silly to, to Christo. Yeah, so yeah. I'm I'm afraid I'm afraid of the shark. So I will never do that. <laughs> there's more on there's more on the land. We'll just tell you that. <laughs> no, oh, yeah, yeah, I know. Uh, in, okay, so on this day, sharks were the furthest thing from anyone's minds. Um, in a in a really sharky area, basically at the mouth of Botany Bay. Uh, you know, a very well known yeah, yeah. shark zone. But um, the waves this day was was 15 foot of swell. Um, so. Oh, no. two, two story house or a bit more um and then what was happening is it, the wave itself that they run the event in breaks 10 meters from a, a rock shelf um and then comes out of really deep water and this this 15 foot of swell actually was kind of folding in half because of how shallow it gets so quick so the wave just basically turned into a thick mound of water volume and just explodes on yeah you know two three foot of water um many thought it wasn't surfable on the day and i was i was one i was i was quite you know honest with people and myself saying look i don't know if these can be ridden um but the decision was made to run run the event i ended up being first heat and i was just i, I went from being you know, I went from <laughs> being like Murphy's law yeah terrified actually really psyched about the whole thing and that's that comes back to the point about like trusting your ability and stuff. And, mm. um, yeah, I just, I, it was, look, they, they only ran a couple of heats that day. A, a guy, there was a lot of really, really bad wipeouts, like really heavy, violent <laughs> you know, <laughs> thrashings. Um, and one, one sort of injury from the day, um, which could have been way worse still once you, when you see the waves, um, but yeah, all in all, like the day will go down in history. Um, we got to capture it, and it's it show, it's showcased in the movie, which is um, you know it ties ties everything in really nicely. Um, just showing what we were willing to do to fund our you know adventures. Round pop. We are very thankful to our sponsors, Grow Clinics. They're leading the way in hair loss treatments in Australia and New Zealand. For those that don't know anything about Grow and might be new to our podcast today. Work everybody through the Grow experience, Dion. Essentially, you have your first consultation, whether it be online or in person. I had mine in person. And they they run uh, essentially a camera over your noggin to see what your donor area is like, see how many hairs they can potentially transplant. Uh, once they identify that, um, they draw the proposed hairline onto your head. So you'll get to see where your new hairline will go. Um, a couple of weeks later, if you feel like you want to do it, you, you book in and then you have the procedure. Now the procedure is pulling single hair follicles from the back of your head and then put them up top. See, they're, they're, the, the hair follicles on the back of your head are resistant to the hormone DHT, which is the, the root cause of hair loss in, in men. So they pull it from the back, put it up top, and it stays there forever, and it looks completely natural because it's your own hair. And it really does, and it grows. It's quite amazing. If you want to book a free consultation and find out more for yourself, go to growclinics.com.au. And it's a thank you for supporting the podcast and a thank you for giving us hair. Manscaped have jumped on board the Brown Park podcast and are proud to support us. We've been lucky enough to be sent their performance package 4.0 and it arrived this week and it's a complete game changer. Uh, inside the package, you're going to find their lawnmower 4.0 trimmer, the weed whacker, which is for ear and nose hairs. Uh, they've got the crop preserver ball deodorant, 
Crop Reviver Toner, performance boxer briefs, and a travel bag to hold all your goodies as well. It also comes with a charger so you can stay charged wherever you are. Look, the fourth generation trimmer features a cutting edge ceramic blade that's going to reduce grooming accidents. Thanks to the advanced skin safe technology, the Lawnmower 4.0 is also waterproof and has a 400K LED spotlight so you can get into your intimate nook and cranny. <laughs> <laughs> or crannies and you know what they say when you shave the hair it gets bigger down there well it's like a giraffe right <laughs> you, you know, you've either got the giraffe in the bush or the giraffe out in the open <laughs> so look it's time to take care of yourself go to manscape.com and at the moment you get 20 percent off and free shipping worldwide with our code Brown Park 20. That's Brown Park 20. Put it in uh, at manscaped.com. You'll get your 20% off and unlock your confidence and always use the right tools for the job with Manscaped. Brown Park. When you're surfing those type of waves, I just want to unpack that for a second because I can never really get it through my head. How do you push yourself over the ledge in those moments? Obviously, you say you've got to, to, to trust your abilities, but to keep paddling and, and not get crocodile arms and go, no, nah, I'm pulling out. I mean, how do you commit and, and mentally push yourself through that? Um, yeah, look, well, so on this day for this event, it was actually, it was it was towing only okay. because you, you could not paddle into these ways, but we can we can definitely like reference that to Tahiti mm -hmm. because like it's very similar in the way that the waves move, like coming out deep water and like get a ton of volume in them. So it's, it's just a matter of like, yeah, you, you've, you've got to trust your instincts. If you decide to fully commit, yeah. the worst thing you can do is hesitate. And then like, you know, you're paddling into a wave and you hesitate and you try to pull back. You're actually in the worst part of the wave and that's when you end up in the lip. And yeah. you're better off falling at the base of the wave than being in the lip. So it's just, you know, for, for yourself, Dion, if you are like starting to push the limits and go <laughs> bigger, like, you're better off like once you decide you you're gonna go and you're committing like just go on, just yeah. head down and go for it hesitation is what will get you flogged basically. and it has it mean it has in the past i mean yeah i mean i've grown up in the gold coast my whole life and um when i was younger i remember there was a cyclone swell and i was paddling paddling out going okay this is this is pushing me myself a little bit here and um yeah i got my ass handed to me on a stick at at, at kira <laughs> in the cyclone swell because i was about to take off over the ledge and um yeah, pull, pulled back and ended up in the lip and uh, went for a went for a nice ride. Wow! Yeah, yeah good if times. You, if you if you made that takeoff and then made the barrel, like it would oh, would have changed like, everything. Yeah, yeah. It would have been the best, probably the best ride of your life. And that's I think that's another thing because even with Tahiti for me, like I was terrified of Chopu, and there was a crew of professional surfers there when we turned up, and we were just watching them go over the falls, you know, on every wave. And me and Blake, I was like, how how am I going to make a takeoff if these car guys can't make a takeoff? You know? <laughs> yeah. And so just watching it and kind of getting your head around it. But once I made one, then I was like, oh, cool. That, yeah, that felt nice. really good. And oh, I kind of get it a little bit. And then I made another one. Then I got went a little bit deeper and I made another one. And then, you know, I got a little wipeout. I was like, oh, okay, it wasn't so bad. So it's kind of like after you experience what it felt like to make it and how stoked you were, you were just like, you almost start to pop out and be like, oh, I kind of want one of those bigger ones now. Yeah. And then like if you get one of those big barrels and you're standing in it, it's just like, you know, yeah, that'd be mad. Yeah, being in a barrel is like the coolest feeling ever, and so I feel like once you kind of had a taste for that a little bit, and you kind of know what it can feel like um, once you make it out, then you kind of like okay, you you're more willing to throw yourself over the ledge because you know like the the risk is worth the reward if you can make it to the end of the wave. And I guess if we want to just go deep on that, it's kind of like life too. Yeah, you've got to push yourself over the ledge and give it a crack, hey? Yeah, for sure. No, it's definitely a lot of lot of um, you know similarities in that sense. You you got to exactly you got to got to commit. You got to and again you got to be prepared and you you want to be across across everything and you know in all that sort of sense and just you know due diligence on, on everything and just yeah exactly right. Just doing your research and and, and you know experiencing that, that sort of stuff, in, you know. Yeah, love it. That's, that's the thing. I remember this one time I got wiped out of the wet and wild wave pool. And, um, <laughs> well, there is wave pools now that actually have full proper waves and you can get yeah. fully barreled and it is a concrete bottom, but it's, yeah, those wave pools now, it's just like... Is it the one in Melbourne? Have you guys There's a couple now, yeah. yeah. Yeah, we've surfed there. It's, it's a great, it's a really, it's a really fun, it's, it's an ocean style of wave. Like, it's just like, it's almost like a, a, the real deal. And as a non-surfer to be able to have the, opportunity to, to to paddle into that 
decent wave in the right spot, you know, that's the hardest part with surfing is trying to learn and trying to paddle and trying to get out the back and not to get smashed and the timing of standing up and to have those wave pools now, you can really dial in your whole, you know, surfing ability and you can learn so much in the pool and then transition that into the ocean. Like you're already you're years ahead of everyone else, really. So talking to a couple of um, surfing purists and then one semi, semi surfing purist, um, what do you guys feel about those wave pools? Do you, are they, do you like them? Do you surf them or do you, would you much rather just go out and the actual surf? Um, I, so I love them. I, I, I have so much fun in them. Um, yeah. At the end of the day, I would, I would always pick the ocean. There's just something like that resonates with you a bit more about, you know, the open ocean. And, and that's like, you was kind of a, um, pointed to is the, the skills and the knowledge and all the years that we've put in the ocean. That's why we, we can understand and we can read and like, that's, that's a challenge in itself, but the wave pools are, you know, I've been down a bunch of times, the one in Melbourne, there's, there's one coming in Sydney too. And I'll, I'll definitely be going to that. It is, it is mind blowing. And I just giggle every time I walk through the gates and just see this machine creating a wave. pretty perfect, albeit small, like perfect ways. It is, it's it's nuts. You used like, to draw that shit on paper at school. It's in, exactly in it. maths. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, and I, I think in a, in a big picture, if it it's it's just going to open the sport up to more and more people. Like if I think about it, and I honestly think that you know it's probably not going to be long until there's a surfing champion from a landlocked country. You yeah. know, like it might be a, a really good snowboarder who just jumps into a wave pool and just figures it out really quickly and. They were never going to surf or, um, you know, they might put a bunch throughout China with the massive population they've got. And all of a sudden there's a, you know, just a, a, a freak talent that emerges. So I think yeah. it's, I think it's good for the sport. It's really good for the progression of the sport. There's a few different variations. So the one in Melbourne's a certain, certain style. There's a couple throughout America that really push the high performance boundary, which create like an air section. So guys are really pushing the progressive side of surfing, massively in these wave pools so great for the sport for me um gills might be different but for me i'd still pick going surfing in the ocean any day though yeah have you given the one at yapuna crack that surf lakes because that looks that looks pretty mental they've got the the slab section of that and i've watched a few guys on that and i'm like man that looks a bit hectic yeah uh that, I, i'd love to go just the the whole setup looks um insane like and i know everyone said a bit of Fully, it looks like Mad Max. It does, like, doesn't it? Yeah. yeah. It always Mad Max, like just, <laughs> and it's blowing smoke. It's like a yeah. prehistoric monster. It's like it's um, breathing. I mean, I've driven past it so many times when I used to go up there for work and I'm like, how do I fucking get in there? And I drive yeah. past trying yeah. to find the road in, but it's obviously through it through a farm or something to get in there. So yeah. hey, you got to go. Yeah, I'd love to. At you some point, it. we'll get there. We're going to do that. <laughs> you yeah. should go. I'll watch you. You're going in, Christo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll do it again. <laughs> Put him on the <laughs> slab straight actually, up. The same thing, like seriously, like you also said, Chris, that there's a there's different like so there's different settings in these wave pools too. So mm. like you can have like the, the, the elite level or you can have just like beginner where it's really rolly. And I think up there, the Yapoon one, I think it's the plunger, but it's in a bay and there's a few different types of waves. So there's gonna be one that's really easy and cruisy, and then there's the really intense slabby one, which is you know yeah. nasty but then so they're, they're kind of they're making it like open to everyone which is um it's, it's really inclusive which is a, yeah, a good great. thing with these wave pools i wanted to touch on something that you guys uh had in in the trailer um and you lost a mate was this along the journey of what you were doing or was this uh what inspired to get out and go and do it uh so we, no we actually lost uh christian who was our well he he was like he was there with us from the beginning as far as like when we were sort of first, you know, brainstorming and trying to figure out what Chase That Feeling was, he was like right there with us. And he, he's um, a cameraman, uh, filmer, like a in the sort of production, sort of editor, sort of producer. And he's all, he was always, you know, he was always the biggest fan of, of this. He was, he loved his extreme sports as well. He loved, you know, mm. you know it's very similar like mine to, to Blake and I. Um, and he actually came along on on our trips to to film and sort of um, to capture these moments. And it was uh, in between. Uh, it was after our Iceland trip, yeah. So he was speed flying in in um, Switzerland, and um, yeah, he he had an accident over there and passed away. So yeah, it was just it was just a huge shock because 
he's you know he was always so good at what he did, but it's just that's the nature of the beast in these in these sports. It's just like you might make one little mistake and no one saw it happen, so we don't actually know exactly what went wrong. Was but, it in a wingsuit? Was it? No, so it was um, um, speed. So he was. It's a parachute um, that you fly. So they run off the cliff, kind of like a paraglider, but um, a speed wing. So it's, it's smaller and it goes faster. But then they have skis on, so you can ski. You kind of oh, skiing okay. down the mountains, and then they launch off a cliff. Then they fly the parachute down to the next bit of snow, and they ski on that bit, and they launch off. So it is quite an extreme sport, but you know, if done correctly, it's you know relatively safe like all these extreme sports like you've, mm. you've done the done the training and done done the preparation but um yeah there's just no there's no information that came out of what actually happened but he had crashed um and fallen off and then his parachute didn't you know it, it wasn't able to to carry him so he, he basically fell off the cliff and, and passed away Jeez. so um yeah we just really wanted to do something special for him in there because you know the, the project was we were we did it all off, all off our own back, like Blake and I, and, you know, Christian was a huge part of it, but just trying to, you know, get a project off the ground, like to film all these, all, all these trips was one thing, but then to try and start to put it all together and try and figure out what it was, is like, it's a, it's a huge challenge. And he was always so motivating. Like a lot of the times we were like, geez, you know, should we keep going? Like, it's just such a, yeah. such a slog, like all of our spare time, you know, over the last almost 10 years went into this. And um, yeah, a few moments there was really tough. And we we're like, should we keep going? And, and he was always like, mate, you got to keep going. You, you know, you, people have got to see this footage, but you got to get it out there. So mm. it was a huge motivation to us just to you know get it over the line and get it finished. And then also we wanted to do a special sort of tribute to him in the movie to say kind of thank you for for you know all of his contribution along the way. Well, okay. So I just want to quickly before we let you go to dinner because I know you you've got to go. Um, <laughs> The highlight of the last seven years, what was the one thing that you've like, I have to go back and do that? So for me, it's Iceland. Um, just, just as a place, um, it's, uh, it's people say it and I, now I've been there. It's, it's dead set magical. Like yeah. the, the landscape changes. There's it's, it feels so ancient. There's volcanoes, there's, there's snow, there's fjords, there's like you can snowboard, you can surf, there's just natural wonders there. Um, it's a long, long way from Australia, but just it is it is mind blowing. We were it was like it was a sensory overload and we left two weeks. And with that summertime, like I said, we you could just do everything. You could not stop for two weeks really, but we uh, the waterfalls are insane. Everything about it, like I think it's a just a really special place. Um and if you, you know, Google it or have a look on Instagram at like, you know, Iceland, anything, it's, it is exactly what you see. Um, so that was, that stands out for me as, as far as like the trip and they, they are, I don't know, a, a life, a fulfilling life to me is measured by experiences. So the more experiences you have, the more fulfilling your life is and what we got to experience throughout the whole journey. But then just to narrow down that Iceland experience was mm. nuts and I'd, I'd love to go back there yeah look i'd have to say iceland as well to be honest it was definitely a special um trip for us obviously having the 24 hours of daylight a little bit younger then so i don't know if we could pull off the same amount of stuff that we did <laughs> back, back then but uh mate, I, I, iceland in, in winter time really really um really would, would attract me obviously the northern lights um and then waves that break on a certain part we, we only went on a certain um sides of iceland there's not another couple of sides of, of the island that uh, we didn't get to go to so i'd love to go back there and surf these waves and um, the landscape does change a little bit too and mm. you, you you know then go snowboarding and surfing um you know in the middle of winter in, in iceland would be it would it'd be wild wild and remote you know it's mad yeah great, great experience well, we can recommend Chernobyl in case you're yeah, looking for Chernobyl. somewhere, <laughs> Chernobyl's, somewhere different. Chernobyl's great, yeah, if you want to go and poison yourself. It's a great place to that go. feeling too. We're going. <laughs> <laughs> you could base Man, jump off one of the abandoned buildings. There you go. Definitely. Yeah. Definitely lock that in. It is actually a phenomenal place. We walked through um, a city called Pripyat, which is like about three kilometres from Chernobyl, and it was a, a city that I'd always wanted to visit because it's literally within four hours they had to abandon the entire city. 
Um, and this was three days after it erupted because Russia was saying, no, there's nothing wrong. There's nothing wrong. Everything's fine. And then they went, okay, so everything's not fine. Get out now. They yeah. had four hours to pack up a city of a hundred thousand or 75,000 people. So there's this entire city just sitting there empty. Yeah. Um, and it's just amazing to see what nature's taken back. Yeah. And the whole building, all the buildings are like just been destroyed and, and, but they're still standing. So there's like a, there's a stadium, a football stadium. Um, and you can't, we were standing and they've gone, you're in the middle of the field and it was just a forest, but then through the forest, you actually see the grandstands that are still sitting there. Yeah. Wow. So it was, it was just, it was phenomenal in that respect to go and have a look at something that, you know, it, it is classified as one of the most dangerous places on earth, but, um, only one of us went really dangerously close to the poisonous areas, didn't we, Dion? Well, we'll have oh, to. Really? I had to see how high I could get the Geiger counter. Just, yeah. just, just, just oh, have to suss it. <laughs> That's it. I'm all, yeah, exactly I'm all right. in. All right. So, yeah. so we'll do Iceland and you do Chernobyl, and then we'll, um, yeah, we'll, we'll meet up again. We'll meet up so after. Definitely. Nice. Good. Well, the movie is uh, looks sensational. It's coming out on um, all the streaming platforms. It's going to be on Amazon. Is uh, Amazon Prime Vimeo on demand? Uh, and a whole bunch of others. You can check out the website, which is chasethefeelingmovie.com. Uh, um, and a quick plug to Mambo as well. Uh, BT and Gil, so best of luck with the movie. It looks sensational, man. Thank you, guys. Thanks for having us. Thanks so much. I just want to leave Dion with one thing quickly, just on the surf thing. All right. So the best the way of your life's going to be the one you think you can't make. So just put your head down from now on and you go, all right? All right, I'm in. I'm in. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> My He's wife gonna is going to kill you. <laughs> so we're going to Iceland. We have to follow I'm, in their footsteps. We, they they told us we've got to go. I've actually, the funniest thing is I've always wanted to go to Iceland. Well, let's chalk that up. Um, I've, I've gone to Antarctica. I've flown over Antarctica. I want to actually go and set foot on Antarctica now, but I've flown over it. But I've really, I've always wanted to go to Iceland because I don't know why, actually. I just wanted to go. Well, they sold it to me. Sounds like it'd be an amazing place to go. Please go and check out their documentary. Um, it's called Chase That Feeling. and It's going to be available on streaming services. We'll put links to everything uh, as we do in our show bio. So you can go and check that out as well. Uh, thank you to our lovely sponsors, Grow Clinics and also Manscaped, who have just jumped on board. Thank you, guys. And um, if you want to support our show, you can go and buy our T-shirts. At Brown Park underscore. That's on Instas. Or you can just jump online to brownpark.com.au. Simple as that. We will see you next time. Bye. Scratch it. The Brown Park Podcast.